Hip dysplasia is a condition where the upper femur and the socket are incompletely formed. And typically the socket is shallow. The upper femur may be a little off in its angles. And I have a model that I've uh, prepared to show you what I mean by that. In this, uh, I've actually shaved off the edge of the socket, of a normal socket, to show you what a dysplastic socket looks like. And you see that the ball partially hangs out of the socket, right? And what that does to a person, instead of it loading the hip through the whole socket, it's more out on the edge, and so it edge loads. Uh, and this leads to tearing of the little cartilage rim that goes around the hip socket called the labrum. Also can wear out this cartilage in the hip socket over time. The diagnosis of hip dysplasia is made at different times of a person's life depending upon how bad it is. There are some uh, family uh, tendencies. It's not strict genetics, but uh, there is a family genetic tendency to have hip dysplasia. So if your mother had a hip replacement, it tends to run much more in women than men. If uh, your mother happened to have hip dysplasia and you've got hip pain in your 20s, you probably should be checked, okay? Uh, when infants are born, one of the routine things that the pediatrician does is they check the hips to see if they can be pushed out of the socket. And if they can, then they worry that they might develop hip dysplasia because hip dysplasia is actually something you develop over the first few years of life, meaning the hip socket and the upper femur don't form normally. You're born with a certain amount of dysplasia, all right? And you can correct that by certain treatments like uh, putting in a harness or that sort of thing for the first few months of life. But, but non-operative treatment works really well as long as you catch it early. The other type of hip dysplasia that we see is much more subtle, and that is just a uh, minor hip dysplasia so the ball doesn't actually pop out of the socket, but it doesn't force its way into the socket as strongly as it should so the socket doesn't form deeply enough. And that is a hip that, as in that model I showed, the uh, rim doesn't extend out over the ball, and so it doesn't load properly. Those people tend to be very flexible because their hip doesn't hit the rim when they bend their hip, okay? And so flexibility of the hip is not necessarily a wonderful thing. Surgery is uh, inevitable for bad hip dysplasia, okay? And Typically, the age of onset of symptoms correlates with how bad your dysplasia is. So people that have pain in their teens and early 20s typically have very low angles of coverage, okay? And uh, people with very poor coverage of the ball um, routinely develop hip arthritis later in life. And we can change the natural history of that disease by doing an operation that brings the socket back over the ball. Now there are people who are more borderline, and those people, it's real controversial what you do for them. Uh, and a lot of those people may get better just with doing some strengthening exercises. Some of them will still develop arthritis later in life, but maybe corrective hip preservation surgery is not the right thing for them. What you have to know is that when you do a corrective surgery for hip dysplasia, what you're doing is taking a shallow socket and putting it in a better position. So it's still a shallow socket, it's just over the top of the ball. So the surface area of contact may still be less, okay? So some of those people may go their whole lifetime with no problems, but there are gonna be others who develop arthritis years later. The numbers that we have uh, are that 60% uh, of people will have uh, a good functioning hip after 20 years. But uh, that is uh, with old uh, selection criteria, meaning some of those people we wouldn't operate on today, people that were done 20 years ago, because they were really too arthritic to really benefit from the surgery. And that's probably the biggest cause of early failure of that surgery, is operating on someone that really already has significant arthritis. So we try to catch people while their symptoms are still fairly mild, and that's a hard thing to do because uh, people don't come to the doctor when they've got mild symptoms. They deal with the pain. And it's also a hard thing to tell a patient that they need a surgery when they have pain that is mild to moderate only after significant activity. 
but day to day they do pretty well.